And I guess maybe um, maybe a good place to start is the analysis of the elastic collision because that. Uh, well, oh, wait, wait. Let me not change that. All right, all right. <laughs> I I got it. Oh. So so let's just start out with the analysis of elastic collision. And let me make it more fun than um than the situation where the two masses are the same. So where the two masses are the same, all right, it's boring. One stops, the other moves. Yeah. Let's uh, make it so that the second mass can have a variable mass. It might be heavier than mass one. Then uh, with the elastic collision, you might say something like this. Or uh, mass 2 could actually be lighter than mass 1. Then after the collision, you would say something like this. I think I've uh, shown a demo like that in lecture as well. So, so let's just start by analyzing this uh, elastic collision first. And then we'll, we'll modify it for the inelastic collision to uh, consider, okay, um, what constraints are we getting rid of? and what constraints still remain. So let me do that. Let's just start out with analysis of elastic collision. So we are imagining a setup like this, where a mass M2 could be any other mass. It doesn't have to be the same as M1. And so this is the before collision. Let me... Um, label it and label some of the quantities so that I can write down my mathematical equations when I get there. So this is before collision. So the balls have some mass, m1 and m2. And the ball 1 has some initial speed. Let me call that v naught. So after the collision, they have some different um, things going on. We still have the same masses, so let me not label them again. But the um, the two balls have velocities. Let me label them uh, v2 vector. And let me label this a v1 vector. I'm going to deviate from the way I like to write my equations normally. Normally, I like to write my equations so that the quantities I write down are expected to be positive. Let me break from that tradition for this analysis and let my quantity, especially V1, be a vector. As you have seen, V1 could be positive, pointing to right, or it could be negative, pointing to left. And I will write my equations in such a way so that if V1 comes out to be positive, then it's pointing to right. Um, and I will um, just uh, let that be. And if uh, after some hours, some analysis steps, if I uh, arrive at leftward v1, then, or if I arrive at negative v1, that indicates, that'll indicate to me that v1 is uh, leftward. So I'll leave v1 and v2 as a vector quantity by letting their signs remain. So that's the interaction. And this is the interaction that we are hoping to analyze using conservation law principles. So when you're using conservation law, um, you go through steps that are similar to this. You start by uh, first identifying what quantities are conserved. Because um, the general approach in conservation law strategy will be that after you identify the conserved quantity, what you can set up is you say conserved quant. Um, uh, at some snapshot one is equal to conserved quantity, the same quantity at a different moment in time, because this is what it means for the quantity to be conserved. It doesn't change after or through an interaction. So with an elastic collision, you have one conserved quantity given to you. The moment someone tells you it's uh, elastic, you are told that kinetic energy is conserved. So with the information that kinetic energy is conserved, you can write down this e expression. You can say kinetic energy of the, or the sum of kinetic energies uh, before collision is equal to the sum of kinetic energies after the collision. 
So let me write out the expression. So the in the before picture, the only the mass m1 is moving. So it must have kinetic energy of one half m1 v naught squared, kinetic energy of m1, and the m2 is at rest, so it's not moving. Uh, no kinetic energy, zero. After the collision, you'll have these kinetic energies. Uh, kinetic energy of m1, um, it's going to be v1 squared. So I guess for now, the sign doesn't matter. 1 half m1 v1 squared plus the kinetic energy of m2, uh, 1 half m2 v2 squared. Now, as you look at this expression, I hope you know this that um, assuming that all that all the quantities in the initial setup is given that's kind of typical you have two unknowns you have v1 that's unknown and you have v2 that's unknown so with the two unknowns <laughs> you need more than one equation and this is the classic sign that you are missing some bit of information so you've used the fact that kinetic energy is conserved but there must be something else that you need to bring in in order to have at least two, two, two equations for the two unknowns. So this is where you need to look through, think through, <laughs> read about collisions again. And um, the important thing about collisions is that when this, or the things that we describe as collision is that as this interaction happens, there's a lot of internal force between these objects and external forces are either zero or negligible. So this is the classic setup that leads to your saying that, oh, momentum is conserved. And once you can say that momentum is conserved, that gives you another equation that you can write down. You can say that the total sum of the momentum before collision is equal to the total sum of the momentum after the collision. So, okay, I need to write that down. Let me write down the expression for momentum before collision, m1 v0. And um, I'm letting the sign of these uh, velocity variables indicate the direction in this one-dimensional setting, um, plus the momentum of ball two is zero because it's not moving. After the collision, uh, so I'm going to write just uh, m1 v1, and uh, if somehow in the situations when where ball one bounces off to the left, then v1 will be negative. So this whole quantity will be negative in those cases. So um, so this is where I'm breaking with my usual convention where I would have put in a minus sign here so that v1 will be positive value, I'm just letting v1 be vector. It might be positive, it could be negative depending on the situation. I'll just leave it in this form. And there's kind of a vector-like thing there. Okay, um, so that's the momentum of m1 after collision, and I need to add the momentum of m2 after the collision. So, so this is my second equation. As you carefully look at it, hopefully you know this. Ah, no more unknowns. Uh, I haven't introduced any, any additional unknowns. So I have a second equation, two unknowns. I should be able to solve it. So, so let's do that. Um, I guess um, let me solve for v1, and I'll leave solving for v2 as an exercise for you. And so. So once I've decided that I want to solve for V1, then paradoxically, what I need to do is uh, I need to solve for V2. Uh, more specifically, my ne immediate next step goal here is to eliminate V2 from my system of equations. And the way you eliminate it is um, you eliminate V2 through substitution. So in order to use substitution, you need to have an expression for V2 in terms of all the other quantities. So I can see here in my equation two, 
oh, I can solve this for V2. So let me do that. Um, so when I do that, this is what I end up with. V2 is equal to, let me scroll down a little. Um, I'm going to move the other term over. So I have M1 V0 minus M1 V1. And to get rid of M2, I divide it through by M2. So divide by M2. Okay, that's the expression for V2. And I use this to eliminate V2 from all my other equations. Well, from my equation 1. So I can write down my equation 1 prime, which will be the same equation I had before. 1 half M1 V0 squared is equal to 1 half m1 v1 squared and now here plus 1 half m2 instead of v2 squared i'm going to plug in this quantity yeah not really um m1 v0 minus m1 v1 over m2 squared and i will tell you uh, before i go on further that it's not going to be pretty and the biggest uh, thing that will should get the blame is the square in my kinetic energy expressions um, that has potential to really complicate my algebra and what i'll just uh, caution you with is um as you try to work through this algebra you might sometimes uh, face this situation where um, you seem to be stuck you just uh, uh, um, you don't know what you have done wrong but you're not quite getting to the value you want to get to and and when something like that happens be willing to just uh, scratch out the work and start from scratch go some other way because uh, when you're doing problem solving sometimes there are cases where you haven't done anything wrong as in you haven't made any steps that someone can point to and say oh that's not right like you might not have done that but even then you can get stuck in some blind uh, blind alleys uh, dead ends so and in those cases sometimes the <laughs> uh, best and most uh, productive thing to do is just to scratch it out and just Try redoing it and maybe trying different route. Maybe solving for V1 or um, trying to get V1 is not actually the right thing to do. Maybe what you should do is solve for V2. Um, so let me proceed here and try to do what I want you to do at the start. So I need to simplify some things here. Let me cancel out this one half so that I don't have to keep writing it. Uh, it cancels out from all the terms. Um, and I think I need to expand this out to get a sense of what that looks like. I have m1 v1 squared plus um, m2 divided by m2 squared. So 1 over m2 times. And I need to write this out. Um, what this will be is m1 v0 minus m1 v1 multiplied with m1 v0 minus m1 v1 so you know i have these terms um so i have m1 squared v0 squared that's one of them and then i have this term uh, minus minus they cancel out so i get plus m1 squared v1 squared uh, and then i have cross terms i have this times that and this times that and i think their product ends up being the same so it's gonna be minus 2 m1 times m1 so m1 squared is still and then v0 times v1 uh, v0 v1 ah okay i was afraid of this so um yeah uh, let me try to collect the like terms so i have my left hand side here so I see some like terms, v0 squared, v0 squared. Let me collect those together. And I have v1 squared and v1 squared. Let me collect those together. And then I'm somehow going to have to deal with this uh, term that's linear in v1. So let, let's do that. Uh, I'm going to collect all the terms with v0 squared. Um, so I have, um, and then factor out for not squared. And when I imagine doing that, so I have um, M1 
and then so m1 squared over m2 moved over to the other side it'll be minus m1 squared over m2 v not squared so okay these terms have been taken care of on the right hand side i have the first term with the v1 squared so m1 and then i have this term m1 squared over m2 so plus m1 squared over m2 um, v1 squared okay these two terms have been taken care of and then i have this last term here um, yeah <laughs> um, minus uh, 2m1 squared over m2 v0 v1 and uh, yeah i don't think i see this as simplifying any further really um so um yeah the thing that makes it complicates this the most is really this that i have v1 squared the term and a term that's linear in v1 so uh, if i really wanted to soldier on and get an answer for v1 then what I would have to do is I can put this into standard form. Um, so standard form would look like this. Um, and then I need the, the second is the linear term. So minus or sorry, plus minus 2m1 squared over m2 v0 times v1. And then I have to move this term over to the other side. So they are all together. Uh, plus, um, I guess I can swap the order. M1 squared over 2, uh, M2 minus M1 uh, times V0 squared. All of that equal to 0. This is the standard term um, that you put quadratic equations into. And labeling this as A, this as B. This says a C. I have a quadratic formula. So if I'm writing down quadratic formula, then it would look like, okay, V1 is equal to, so the quadratic formula is um, minus B plus minus square root of B squared minus 4AC divided by 2A. Uh, when you put your equation into standard form as I have. So V1 would be equal to, okay, minus B, so minus minus, so that's plus 2m1 squared over m2 v0 plus minus square root of um, 4m1 to the fourth m2 squared v0 squared minus 4 times um, ac. So that would be m1 plus m1 squared over m2. Uh, times c um, m1 squared over m2 minus m1 uh, v not squared all of that under the square root divided by 2a 2 times m1 plus m1 squared over m2 yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a bit of a surprising uh, simplification, but I think even with that, uh, this is a really tedious expression. The biggest of which being is this plus minus business. business. Um, I mean, <laughs> why plus minus? I mean, <laughs> shouldn't there be just uh, one value of we want? Why are there two possibilities? <laughs> who knows so um i think i'm gonna take my own advice even though i can try working through this uh, simplifying it try to get a sense of what we want is i have a sense that that's uh, not going to result in an expression that's very illuminating so so this is what i mean be willing to scratch out your work and just to redo it i'm just gonna go all the way back to the beginning and just to change my mind instead of eliminating v2 
even though I want V1 in the, in the end, let's just uh, um, eliminate V1 first. Maybe that'll result in a more um, manageable expression. I don't know if that'll be the case, but I gotta try it out. Yeah, so let's, uh, uh, let's uh, redo it. Um, so even though I'm saying I want V1 in the end, um, I'm going to bite down and choose to eliminate V1 first. <laughs> let's see what we get. So, um, so all right, then, then let me go through the basically the same set of steps, except where uh, one fork in the road where I have taken a right before, I'm going to take a left now. Instead of solving this for V2, I'm going to solve it for V1. So solving it for V1, I get this. Okay, I move V2 over, I divide it through by V1, I have V0 minus M2 divided by M1 V2. Okay, so let's use this to eliminate V1 from my equation 1. And uh, I, I'm going to come back to this because eventually I will want a value for V1. So I'll come back to it, but later. Um, so just writing out what I'm going to label my 1 prime. Um, so my equation 1, just eliminating V1. 1 half m1 v0 squared is equal to 1 half okay m1 and instead of v1 squared i have this expression v0 minus m2 over m1 v2 squared plus uh, 1 half m2 v2 squared and um, you could be excused in thinking isn't this the same deal as before we still have these squares and um, things are still going to get complicated. But I have a, a bit of a experience with expressions like this. I think some things is going to magically simplify. So let's just work through it and see. Uh, I'm going to expand this out. So expanding it out, uh, what it will be, so, you know, it's a V0 minus M2 over M1 V2 times itself. V2. So you have V0 times V0, you have V0 squared, and so on. So let me just write it out. I have 1 half M1 times V0 squared, and then I have this term here, so that's going to be plus M2 squared over M1 squared V2 squared, okay? And then I have cross terms, V0 times that, and this times v not they are going to result in the same product. So I'll have, say minus 2 m2 over m1 um, v not v2. Okay, that's my first term. And then I still have plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. And I hope now as you are staring at it, you see some magical cancellation. I have this term here. 1 half m1 times v0 squared. That's identical to this on the left-hand side. They are going to cancel. Okay. Then we did the cancellation. Let me just uh, distribute this and write down a simplified version. I have 0 is equal to 1 half m1 times this term here. So that will be 1 half m2 squared over m1 v2 squared, okay, minus, I have 2 times, okay, so 1 half cancel, m1 cancel, so I have a minus m2 times v0 v2 plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. Now, you might think, isn't this the same as before? You have still squared terms and linear terms, but watch that you have zero on the left hand side this time which means i can multiply both sides by one over v2 to turn this quadratic equation into a linear equation this is going to cancel out one factor here this factor here and one factor here so what you end up with is zero is equal to um, so I guess let me combine some of the like terms here. I have 
one half m2 factor that out front and i have this term m2 over m1 plus uh, i guess this is one and then v2 factor it out to the right minus m2 v0 so i this is a now linear equation i can solve this for v2 let me do that v2 is equal to uh, moving this over m2 v0 over one half m2 m2 over m1 plus one um, yeah and I, I can simplify this a little bit make it look prettier cancel this out uh, maybe multiply numerator and the denominator by um, by 2 m1 I'm trying to get rid of nested fractions um, and when you do that you end up with okay 2 m1 v0 divided by so 2 cancel that out m1 distributing it in I have and uh, 1 times m1 so 1 plus uh, m2 over m1 times m1 so m2 this is my beautiful expression for v2 i didn't have to use any quadratic formula it just uh, worked out <laughs> and um it, again this is the potential complication doing working through algebra involving elastic collisions it really does come down to these squares and i can't tell you a good systematic reason why the second method worked why the second approach worked while the first approach resulted in this uh, super ugly expression um, there isn't some good rule of thumb i can give other than that i've done this particular version enough times to know that um, when i see this um, specifically when i see this v naught with no other coefficient in front, I knew that this cancellation was coming. Um, and trial and error is really the way to navigate through here. So, okay, I'm actually not done. So I have this V2 and um, I have to plug that in into my boxed expression here to get uh, my V1. And there I can get some result and take a look at it and uh, hope hope that it makes sense so this is equal to v naught minus m2 over m1 times this expression for v2 which is going to be 2 m1 v naught over m1 plus m2 um, you see some cancellations m1's cancel um so and I think there's a, a further simplification I can do. So I can factor out the common factor of Vina, Vina times, I have one minus M2 over M1 plus M2. And there's a technique for simplifying an expression, wait, sorry, two M2. Um, technique for simplifying expression like this, you rewrite one as, um, as, a, as the fraction that has the same denominator. So it, this one should become m1 plus m2 divided by m1 plus m2. That's one, just written differently. Now you can see some, some, uh, some simplification here. This m1 plus m2 minus 2m2, that simplifies. That simplifies as m1 minus m2 this 2m2 you know cancels out one factor and then you still have minus m2 left so so with all of that simplification this is my final simplified expression for v1 v1 is equal to v0 times m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 and here's the reason i would recommend that you practice simplifying expressions this simplified expression gives you some insight into what you saw happening so with the simulation you saw that depending on how these masses compare um, m1 either bounces back or it doesn't bounce back and 
how they compare is basically a matter of how is M2 greater than or smaller than M1. And this simplified expression is saying that when M2 is greater than M1, then your V1 will be negative. And negative V1 means leftward, uh, M moving M1 after the collision. So, so that's uh, the analysis of this uh, particular elastic collision that can be a lot of fun to work through and a lot of good practice. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's it. Um, let's see what else is here. Um, there is actually a second solution that I've kind of ignored, I think. Um, so the second solution that I've ignored is, um, I guess um, this is the place where it got wrapped under. Um, so depending on who you had for your math classes, algebra classes, I know there are, I've had the math teachers in when I was a student who would have frowned at operation like this. You have to recognize that when you do division like this, you are excluding a potential solution for a solution. So this implies that you are assuming that V2 is not equal to zero. Because if it is, you can't divide by V2. And um, go back. See if uh, you can get a solution with V2 equal to zero. The answer is yes, you can. <laughs> and the solution you get, it matches up with, um, basically imagine if uh, this ball just uh, passed through M2. That's basically uh, what the solution with V2 equal to zero is. And I'm pretty sure if you work through this other one, plus minus, um, you, one of the solutions out to be like a V1 is equal to V0. And so there are actually two possible values of V1. Um, so one of them corresponds to when the collision actually happened, and the other one corresponds to when they missed each other and collision didn't happen. So, yeah. All right. So that was a lot of fun and long a lot of time. <laughs>